we always hear root through the floor, right? right? Root through the floor when you're lifting. And it wasn't honestly until I took a, a course in barefoot rehabilitation that I really understood what that mean, what that means and how important are the feet. And actually, once I started getting my feet and my toes to actually start working, no joke, within, I think, like two workouts, I had an 18 rep PR on my lifts. Welcome to Barbell Shrug. I'm Anders Varner hanging out at Paleo FX in Austin, Texas. Doug Larson in the house. What's up, Good to bro? be here. Yo. And our boy, Mr. Strong Coffee, Adam Von Rothfelder. <laughs> Killing it, right? Dude, I told you you're getting 100% today. Here we go. <laughs> we are joined by a really, really awesome guest today. I'm super intrigued to talk to you, not just because kettlebell champion, there's some weird bag stuff going on. You said the word of it. I forgot it. Can't wait to dig into okay. this this bag thing that I saw on your Instagram. Ah, I got Super you. interesting. And you're uh, doing a couple of movement seminars, kettlebell things um, at Paleo FX. We're going to dig into this. Mike Salimi. What's up, y'all? Um, <laughs> give us a little background on kind of how you got into the kettlebell thing because that is kind of where you've made your name and where you're, you're the kettlebell champ. Hmm. I love kettlebells. The sport of kettlebells is a little bit beyond me. I don't really have much of a history, and so I really want to dig into kind of where where your background is, and then how'd you get into the sport of kettlebells? It's not like that's like the NFL. <laughs> like not a lot of people are like really involved in it. Um, so it's like the least, the, the world's least known sport. But, but, yeah, you know, not, cool. but it's getting more popular now because of you. I, I hope so. Look at that. I hope so. You know, but my background really started as an athlete. I've been pretty much an athlete my whole life. I started as a gymnast from a young age, and gymnastics, I always say, left gave me the foundation for to appreciate movement and awareness at every level. No matter what sport I've competed in, it started in gymnastics, and then it transitioned to competitive powerlifting for almost two years, then Olympic weightlifting, then kettlebell sport, and now it's kind of a combination of everything. But I've been super, super fortunate at every level and every sport that I've competed at to have amazing coaches and amazing mentors. So when I was a gymnast, my coach was uh, Krasimir Dunev. He was the silver medalist in 96. He also went to... Uh, to Barcelona and he was a high bar specialist so that was my coach growing up and like the dude looked like an Adonis so from a young age like that was my role model and you know he grew up in the Soviet system and so training methodology I mean he was taken almost like he was taken from his home into the training facilities that's what he eat sleep slept and breathed and so you know I remember from a young age maybe like when I started with him he was my second coach maybe around 10 11 years old he was like if you want to look like me if you want to be like me if you want to move like me first thing you got to do is no fast food. So I remember coming home right away, and that's when I went to my mom. I said, Mom, no more McDonald's. We had McDonald's, Carl's Jr., Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut literally right down my street. Uh, and it's actually the same home that I live in right now, which is pretty special. But we, uh, you know, she's like, what? I was like, no, Krasimir says no. And, you know, and, and that's, that was my first exposure yeah. to movement and, and through gymnastics. But due to injury, you know, it's interesting because at every single level of every sport that I've competed at, the transition from one sport to the next all happened due to injury. Yeah. So injury took me out. I had a growth spurt, and then I realized, one, I'm getting tall, so uh, it's not really conducive to being a gymnast. But two, I was never never nearly at the level that I would say I could compete at a high level in gymnastics. So from gymnastics, I had a chiropractor who at that time was the drug-free bench press champion of the world in one of the major federations. And so he was like, you know what? You're, you're pretty strong. You can move well. Why don't you come down? Why don't you train with me? And he was a part of a very, very small, close-knit powerlifting team. So he brought me in, and it was a key club, so members only. And there was maybe like 16 or so of us in there, and very intense, very focused. But it was an amazing experience. So the mentor that I had from uh, Krasmir from gymnastics then turned into the owner of this gym. And a lot of the principles as I was getting into powerlifting was modeled after Louis' principles. Um, I know you guys are super familiar with Louis. Yeah. And so, you know, I started there as a young age, had a v young age, had a very good foundation of strength and really, really took to all the power lifts so much so that, you know, I've always loved being an athlete, but I think even more so as a coach. So I was fortunate enough to travel to Ohio, spend about a month when I was 18 with oh, Louie nice. and train over there. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, the owner of that gym, his name was Steve Yugi, took me under his wing, really 
kind of taught me the ropes for the first eight to ten years. And then, uh, you know, Louis kind of took it to a whole nother level. Yeah. Um, so then, and then Olympic weightlifting. Uh, fortunately, we have Jim Schmitz at home. So I spent a year or so with Jim Schmitz just trying to get a little bit more familiar with the, with the Olympic weightlifting movements. And then, uh, actually, the first time your question, answer your question, how did I get into kettlebells? It was first at Westside. So at Westside, uh, you know, we're talking when I was 18, 19, so we're talking like 12, 13 years ago. Um, you know, at that time, I think right before Pavel, maybe Pavel or Cotter, I think it was Pavel had come out there, worked with those guys maybe in the few years prior. And at least when I was there, I don't know what they're doing now, but at least when I was there, they were just using basic movements, swings. Primarily, we were just using swings and just like tricep extensions and all that stuff. But so I first used that to supplement and help the power lifts, and I effing loved them. And so I always, so right when I got home, Louie connected me with someone that I could buy bells from. And at that time, I still own them. They're like the worst bells in the world. We're not only, I mean, I have nothing against all bells, but not only were, you know, handles misshaped and, yeah. you know, all sorts of crazy stuff, mm -hmm. but those are my first bells. And um, you probably still get a lot done with, with the shitty kettlebells. Oh, like, you can get. Just like a bad barbell, like you can still get brutally strong, even if your equipment isn't like best in the world, if you're just like putting forth a putting forth 100% effort. Oh, absolutely. When I, I was training in Russia and uh, out there, they, uh, you know, all the kettlebells were all, the handles were all misshapen. So here now I'm used to like, like Kettlebell Kings is the, the bells that I use, amazing quality bells. I help those guys kind of give them feedback to make better and better bells. And all the handles are precise, 35 millimeter standard, window sizes exactly, bell sizes exactly, balance is excellent, single cast, you name it. But when we were in Russia, the handles themselves, like some of them were like divots, you know, like V's. And so you can imagine. Uh, we'll really, get really narrow. Like well, actually still round, but at the bottom, think like it was a, a poorly sh poor, poor weld or poor construction. So you're grabbing like a point almost? You're grabbing like a point. Yeah. And imagine uh, lifting that. Uh. For kettlebell sport, we lift for 10-minute long events consistently. So even if Which it's just sounds fucking brutal, by the way. <laughs> Every time I think of kettlebell sport, I'm like, those guys are fucking tough as nails. You have to have a ton of grit to be a fucking kettlebell yeah. competitor. To cycle like 270s for 10 minutes straight, you have to be mentally to fucking strong as shit. Can you set them down? No. no. Well, you can set them down, but the set's over. Uh, yeah. So you, that's a part of the time. that's a part of the sport. Oh, it's like yeah. sitting you here and just being like, okay, I can, uh, can I do more? Yeah. We, we always yeah, say, well, yeah. What does that event look like? Just for people that don't know. Yeah. So you're embracing the suck, as we yeah. call. It. <laughs> so it's either here or here's your rest period. If you stop here, like you can't, you sets over. Like you can't do a double swing. But if you're just listening, he he can rack the kettlebells at shoulder height, or he can hold them locked out overhead. But you can't like hang, like you can't just like. You know, like a farmer's walk. You can't just, like, stand there with them in your hands. Yeah. No, no, that's too easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not Russian enough. <laughs> I want to dig into, though, uh, kind of that gymnastics background. I feel like gymnastics really is, like, just this basic movement sport that makes everything else in your life easier. There's so many good athletes that come out of a gymnastics background and how just understanding how to organize your spine and move in space will transfer over into everything else you do. Uh, did you find that as you, I mean, what was the injury that you had? And then when you got into powerlifting, were you able to see some of the connections and how those sports play together? Certainly, I, like I mentioned earlier, like I wasn't even a high level you know, gymnast at all, but just laying in you know, six days a week of practice, sometimes double days, it's like <laughs> yeah. for, for years. Days, six days a week. Just yeah. six yeah. days oh, a week. Right. Yeah. Like you know, double days. I dabbled. <laughs> it's okay that you didn't go to the Olympics. You're right, still right, right. a pretty good no, athlete. No, no, <laughs> not, not at all. But just that level of awareness, that level of body control certainly has served me so well over the years. Yeah. And also, you know, outside of the physical you know, every single time, like I remember being, you know, being so afraid to go to practices because you're learning a new skill, right? You, you, you'd be faced with your fears every single day. And I think if we look at the developmental theme behind that, it's like, you know, those are all light. You know, everything that I've learned in the weight room has served me so well in other areas of my life. So getting comfortable with failure, mm -hmm. going up against your fears. And so that was just routine. Yeah. And so even, you know, what might seem not scary for someone else is could petrify, you know, myself. So, you know, having to do that, but also having the support of a good coach, someone who you trust, you know, was amazing for me. So I've been able to take that into different endeavors. Like even being here, like, I'm just like, you know, this is, this is a big deal event or even, you know, sharing this podcast with you guys. I feel so honored to be here, but it's like, you know, sometimes there's those fears rise up, but you just say, you know what, yeah. you got to go through it because on the other side, the celebration, you just know it's going to be so much more beautiful. What is it like in, um, in you're in Ohio, Louis not a normal human being. <laughs> what is wrong with that guy? Why is he so smart? Like, what, what, what are you? What's, what's going on? Why did you go there? 
Well, so when I was so when I first started at Steve Gym, which is the Palace Gym, I'd been there for about four or five years, and the gym was amazing. It is amazing, but I really wanted to be a coach. Um, and at that time, the highest level, and I think still the highest level, hands down, in competitive powerlifting is Louis. And so I always knew, like, if you want to be the best, you have to surround yourself with the yep. best. If you want to be the best athlete, you also have to train with the best athletes. And so he was the highest level of education. And I have, so, dude, I have, like, closets full of VHSs from way back when. And I remember being at the, I was, like, 18, yeah, still in high school, and just watching, you know, the dynamic effort method videos, like, over and over and over. And I used to watch him so many times because I couldn't understand a word he was saying. Right. He was talking <laughs> so fast. That's part of his marketing. <laughs> <laughs> you like, have I'm to gonna gonna just confuse the shit you. out of everyone. <laughs> and now come here yeah. and, and pay me yeah. money to learn. Yes. Come to the middle of nowhere, <laughs> train in this place that has no air, and you'll be stronger than everyone else in the world. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. He's and an interesting guy. So I got to, you know, watch his stuff and I was like, Man, I don't understand too much of this stuff. Yeah. You know, I'm eighteen, this is ten plus years, thirteen years ago or whatever it was, and I was like, But this shit works. Yeah. So I started using the principles with my team and then I went out there for a month. And actually, it started, I gave him a call. I gave him a call like, hey, this is someone who, you know, he's in Ohio. I'm in California, NorCal. I call him up out of the blue. I'm like, you know, my name is Mike Salemi. I'm a competitive power lifter. I told him two sentences about me. I said, I would love the opportunity to come and just sit in a training session, yeah. whatever it is, anything that I can do to be around you. I would just love to be there. And uh, this was like a few months before I went out. It was the summer when I was 18. And he goes, come on out. <laughs> just, just come on out. Yeah. Book a flight. And I was like, what, really? And so I called him again, like a few days before, like a week before. I said, Louis, this is me, you know, Mike again. I don't know if you remember me, but uh, I got my flight booked. <laughs> I'm coming out. He's like, okay, great. I'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Dude, every time I've ever pulled up to West Side, Louis is always there. He's always standing in the parking lot with his shirt off, and someone's like, someone has like 300 pounds in a wheelbarrow, and they're just like, they're just walking around, and we're like, hey, Louis. And he's like, all right, guys, okay, come on in. We're squatting over here. <laughs> and like, he just brings us in. We've never signed any waivers. We never like asked him to show up. He just like, everyone can just come in and train, and he's happy to coach you. He's amazing. As Mike. long as you're working hard. He'll love you. That, you stand around and watch? Not so much. You got to train. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, you know, I haven't kept in touch with him since then, and I would love to connect with him because I was only there for a month, but he's left such such an impression for my whole life because, you know, when I was there, I didn't even have a car. I didn't even have a license or anything. And so the hotel I booked, I was like, oh, I'll walk or I'll ride a bike. And so I got there. I actually went to, like, one of the local, I don't know, like their version of Costco or whatever it was, bought a bike. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I tried to go to West Side. I was like, wow, well, it's dangerous over here trying to make it from the <laughs> hotel to the gym. I was staying in a, not a great hotel. It was okay. It was safe. But I was like, man, this isn't the smartest idea. And then Louis goes, how are you getting here? Well, I was going to ride my bike. He's like, well, it's not a great idea. You know, I'll, I'll pick you up. Mm. And so he was kind enough, never knowing me before, just having to talked to me on the phone for what, whatever it was, one to three months before, said, I'll pick you up once, twice a day. And we were training, you know, four days a week, sometimes five days a week picked me up for a kid he never knew, brought me in, threw me right into the rotation. Like, mm -hmm. you get thrown into a wow. pack of wolves right away. And I remember deadlifting. Like right into the squat flight? Uh, I, I remember, I'll never forget being thrown in. Do you guys recall Chuck Vogelpohl? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. So I, I remember doing rack pulls with Chuck in the morning. And literally, they were going up in 100, you know, uh, 50 kilo plates. Right. And so right. at that time, my deadlift, actually right when I left there was 615. And so we were doing rack pulls below the knee. And I literally got three attempts in. <laughs> so it was like the warm up. You know, and then yeah. 50, 50 kilo, 50 kilo, 50 kilo. And I was like, well, I'm out of the rotation. <laughs> <laughs> so I got That's three. Part, <laughs> part of getting strong is like, oh, fuck, I'm, I got no one to hang out with anymore. Yeah. I get stronger being, just being, to be being able forced to hang on the out. bench. Yeah. Being forced on the bench makes you want to be stronger. And yeah. then Vogelpohl went up to like mid nines, I think, in the rack. And I was just like, wow. Was AJ there then? AJ Roberts? Not that I recall. Gotcha. John Stafford was there, a few other guys, uh, but I don't believe AJ Robs. Yeah. Not when I recall. Yeah. What, what were you weighing with a 600 plus pound deadlift? Uh, 176. I was in the 181 Dang. class, Solid. so I was yeah, Strong. 615 dead, 605 squat, and 470 bench. Baller, and killer. When you you know going back to kind of in your gymnastics background, at what age did you start that at? I think I started around eight ish, give or take. Eight ish. Yeah. And then in between that and your experience at Westside, you know, ten years later, w what was the like the the curve of your athleticism going forward? Was it always gymnastics? Did you, were you? I mean, were you supplementing strength training in your gymnastics already? You know, like at a young age, did that like start later on? Where you're like, oh, I should be stronger, whatever it is. You know, that's funny. Like, you know, I feel super blessed that I had Krasmer as my gymnastic coach because we used to have Fridays as strength days. Mm. And <laughs> looking back, I probably wouldn't put a kid through it, but it was no joke three hours of conditioning. 
straight conditioning. Mm -hmm. And I remember being the first time I did it when I went to his gym, I was literally sore for almost like two weeks. <laughs> and uh, so I was first, I would say, exposed to like body weight, intense strength and conditioning yeah. back then. So at a young age. So when I went with Krasmer, I think I was like 11 or so years old. But then once I injured my back and I met up with uh, this guy, Mike Ludovico, the power lifter, there was a rehab phase. So firstly, you know, definitely it was rehab. But at that time, I was also competing in, or um, playing football at high school. Got it. And uh, our high school was super competitive. We had uh, – I went to the high school with, like, Barry Bonds, Tom Brady, Lynn Swan. So super athletic high school. And uh, I remember when we were playing football, like, I was a freshman and, you know, I was okay. But I remember never wanting to leave the weight room. I would, like, always, like – Put me a third string. Like, I don't even need to go out there. I just want to hang out and just hang out in the weight room. And that's really how I would say I found weightlifting was like, man, I really love this stuff. And uh, I want to see about it, how I can continue with it. So at the end of my freshman year, I was talking to Dr. Mike. And I was like, you know, I want to I stick with this. I want to see where I can go with it. So started in gymnastics with Krasmer on those Friday conditioning days. And then just those little weightlifting workouts in football. Uh, and then I was like, dude, I, I want to be in the gym. Did you find yourself to be uh, stronger than a lot of the kids that you were of equal proportion just because of the gymnastics training? You know, because gymnastics has such a great isolative, isolation component, and that's a strength that a lot of people are missing in today's culture with, like, constant movement and that being able to isolate. Do you, did you feel that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I was one of the stronger guys on the team. Definitely we have guys that were much bigger than me because at that point, freshman year in high school, as I was coming out of gymnastics, I was on the skinnier side, on the smaller side. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't, you know, one of the bigger guys, but I definitely could push a good amount of weight. And then I had the awareness to, you know, self-correct and different things. Yeah. So I had more awareness when there was some Olympic movements taught, even though we didn't have too much teaching in them. Uh, but I was able to kind of learn a little bit quicker than maybe some of the guys. I find uh, that gymnasts have a better ability to correct, like, their head and neck alignment. Head and neck alignment because they're, like, finishing, like, looking a certain way. And it's almost like something that they snap to very well. So that's That's, that's an awesome. interesting observation, yeah. yeah. Did, did your lower body lag behind your upper body for any period of time? Since gymnastics, especially strength-wise, is so upper body dominant. You know, that's interesting. I never would have thought of that, but I would say that that's definitely an accurate statement mm -hmm. for sure. But it's interesting because I gravitated, much, like, the deadlift for so long. Now I would say probably the squat, but the deadlift for so, so long was my favorite lift hands down. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was because, like, we never really did that, you know, in gymnastics or anything like that. So yeah. you always want to learn what hopefully you're not very good at. Yeah. And so it's like, I suck at this. I want to learn it. I want to put my reps in. And yeah. so I love lower body training. So I would definitely say there was a definite discrepancy. Yeah, because your deadlift is really, really high compared to your squat. Most, most power lifters squat a little bit more than they deadlift. But you, well, you were like six and six, right? Something, yeah, something six, six fifteen, a little higher dead than I was the squat, so fit ten pounds. Yeah, I mean, w world records for squatter in the twelves. The very recent world record for deadlift just hit eleven, eleven hundred. So squat typically is a little bit more. Were you were you wearing gear like were I you was in wearing a squat gear. suit yeah. and all that? I was wearing yeah. gear, yeah. Yeah, even with a squat suit, like oftentimes squat suits help the squat more than the deadlift, and so that's part of the reason that people squat more than they deadlift, but. That's really interesting that you're you're more balanced between those two movements. Yeah, I found that's, a, that's I would say that's totally accurate. Like what I found on the deadlift, even though I definitely did straps up suits, like I was most comfortable just deadlifting and groove briefs, and then I would just throw a singlet over it, mm -hmm. just because I had more freedom to get down. But I found for sure on the squat, like being totally wrapped up, cinched up, like it definitely helped. But the deadlift, it, for me, a lot of times it was more of just getting in the proper positioning made it a little bit more tougher to be in the gear. Deadlift. So a lot of my pulls, best pulls happen just in groove briefs. Yeah. Did you wrap 615? Did you, were, you, uh, were you raw or were you like, uh, were you fixed to the bar? Were you using hand straps? No, I, I was not using hand straps. Wow, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah no, so no, no, that raw was, grip, that's awesome. Yeah, raw grip, yeah. yes. It's interesting that you went from that powerlifting piece, though. I feel like a lot of powerlifters, they just really lack the mobility to be able to get into certain positions and then transferring that into Olympic lifting. Um, I lived in San Francisco for like three months and had no car, no money, no anything. And all I really wanted to do in that three month period, and it never happened, was like take the nine buses that it was gonna take me to get to Schmitz's gym so I could just be in that room with that guy. What What is that experience like? like when I moved there, I was just learning about Olympic weightlifting and I was just like, I have to go to find this guy. <laughs> he has answers for me. Like, how do it's I like get there? like a unicorn. There? Yeah, but it, I literally, like, there was, it was like one of those things where I had, I was living in the studio apartment that cost me way more money than any tiny studio should ever cost anybody. No car. Like, it was like four or five buses just to get there. And it was like, I, I just can't do this right now. But what is that experience like? That place is incredible. Was this when he was at Physique Magnifique downstairs in the basement? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I know it was like, yeah. Yeah, because in the old days, he was in the sports palace. Weightlifting had not taken off at all. It was still like a pretty underground like strength sport, and that's why it was like 
impossible to get to where he was. I don't even know where he is now, but um, it was it was far enough away that it was just like I couldn't justify literally the 45 hour whatever the hell it was to get there. I remember just being like, I can't do this right now. Like, um, but what is that? What is that experience like? He's a he's a master. Like, he's, oh, he, he's incredible. He's amazing, and I only stayed with him for about a year, mainly because like I, I mean, I really my whole objective from working with him was just to get I had no introduction really a little bit in football but not much at all especially because I only did football for a year freshman year of high school so I just really wanted to learn the Olympic lifts a little bit better get an introduction so that I could feel more comfortable teaching them so I my whole goal was like I'm going to work with I want to work with the best of the best that, that I can get access to for something reasonable where you go through a legit training cycle um, that's why I went to Louis for, for a month. Like I wanted to do a full, at least three weeks, uh, you know, sequence there. So with Jim, I was like, I think I was with him for about 10 months. And I said, you know what, I'm going to stick with this for at least as long, you know, six to nine months until I compete. And so, you know, I didn't do anything crazy whatsoever in Olympic weightlifting, but it was an amazing experience to, to work with Jim. And what I will say, what I was so amazed at, you know, the trainings were very good, but one of the things that really blew me away is when I just did that one competition with Jim, was just working and being being handled by an amazing coach. Yeah. You know, like I was so that's you know, coming from Westside or coming from still competing for a number of years before that, you know, I'd been handled by different coaches. And I was so amazed and so interested at like, you know, how he would keep you calm or how he would uh, you know call your reps or just just the subtle things that you notice about a coach when he's coaching a lifter, I was I just felt so taken care of. And um, so, yeah, I never went far enough to really do anything legitimate with it, but or in terms of like big numbers or anything like that. But yeah. in terms of having that experience of, you know, learning some of the basics and then feeling what like a true master coach yeah. is in Olympic weightlifting, it was incredible. Did you have trouble learning the lifts or was your time just around barbells enough? Because you've seen a lot of strong people and all of a sudden you give them an Olympic lifting movement and all of a sudden snatching is like this arm movement. <laughs> and they don't understand their hips. They don't understand pulling under the bar. Uh, did you struggle with any of that stuff? I definitely did. I think the gymnastics, honestly, you know, the powerlifting hands down let that found, made that foundation of strength for yeah. sure. So that's the base, right? But in terms of like understanding the movement of the Olympic lifts, yeah. honestly, I think gymnastics served me for better sure. than anything else. So there was a, a first like, you know, Honestly, three-ish months was awkward, yeah. you know, just <laughs> very, very awkward feeling the groove and finding where it is. And it's still like I can improve so much, you know, even though I practice the Olympic lifts a little bit now. But there's so much more than I can improve. But it, there was definite, uh, a definite struggle there in the beginning. Yeah. The uh, You said all of these kind of transitions have stemmed from some sort of injury. Uh, how did that lead into kind of the, the kettlebell piece that you're – more known for absolutely so i left gymnastics due to a lower spine injury so i had a pinched nerve right around l5 s1 so that was the first thing and i didn't quite know what it was but i got you know relief working with the chiropractor but in terms of uh you know kettlebell sports so we discussed you know to your question doug earlier like what is kettlebell sport for the lifter listeners who aren't familiar with it so classically it's a sport based out of russia and it's the primary way in which they condition and train the russian military so what we use classically, now there's different events now, but classically, there's two main events you can compete in. The one that I've been competing in for almost nine years, which I would say is like, quote unquote, my bread and butter that I really love, is called long cycle. So long cycle is two kettlebells, one in each hand. The professional division is uh, 232 kilo kettlebells, so 72-ish pounds each. And then we also have amateur division 224 kilos or 216 kilos for men as well. But professionals, 232 kilos. So you swing two bells through the legs behind the body, clean them up to chest level, jerk overhead, pause, fixate. So that means the bell has to stop and the body has to stop moving. Then you lower the bells down, swing through the legs, and you repeat as many times as possible via judging, making sure what's a legal rep, in 10 minutes. You can't set the bell down, otherwise the set's over. And so that's long cycle. <laughs> Uh, Sound, yeah, sounds awesome. <laughs> if you're listening, well, one thing I, I dare you to try it. Really, <laughs> really interesting about that. And people listening in their car right now or wherever you're listening to the podcast, get into the YouTube because the way you move, like if I were to do that event, I don't even know if the strength would break down. But just in you practicing that shoulder positioning, I can see that your movement probably from some of those gymnastics days and understanding just like body awareness probably gives you a massive advantage in the sport. 
I would absolutely say, yeah, that body control, that yeah. body awareness, even, again, just those few years as a, as a young athlete s has served me so well, yeah. so well. I can't do a handstand that well, <laughs> so I'm probably going to suck at going overhead <laughs> for 10 straight minutes with 72-pound kettlebells. You'd be pretty shaky. Yeah. Well, I, mean, well, I mean, it's interesting because so much of gymnastics is, you know, getting that sacred, that pelvis yeah. to, you know, finish forward and so many things you do, whether it's a flip, you know, getting the knees up, keeping the chest straight. And when you get that kettlebell, it's that all carries carries through very nicely and protecting that lower back when you're sitting in that position in the rack you kind of sink in right so you're sitting in here you demonstrate you're the you're the pro at yeah, yeah yeah so what you're demonstrating is i would say like you're doing uh, it good <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah yeah i'm so nervous am i doing it right <laughs> I've, I've, I've done a little bit of it you know i've done a little bit i i I've worked under pavel when i was like 21 I oh, like, right. yeah so i mean but i mean i have never competed uh but i know that you know with that with that jerk-like position, a lot of people will kind of get into their lower back. And that actually becomes the fatiguing aspect where a lot of the guys can't get back into this tucked position anymore. And they're like holding on to it here, and they start losing it. Absolutely. So essentially the rack position that we use in kettlebell sports, so we have a few strategies. So let's, let's maybe talk about if people are familiar with hard style, more of like the Pavel type of training. That would be more of a hinge-based type movement in terms of the lower body. What's the lower body doing? The main qualities that it's expressing is primarily power and power endurance, right? So it's a hinge-based movement that's derived from a deadlift. The breathing pattern that's used is more of a, a stabilization-type breath, right? Usually a pressurized exhale. When you compare that to strategies that we use in kettlebell sport, it's a little bit different because now the goal is how, how, how much can we maximize both movement and energetic efficiency? And I would say there's three, three to four primary ways. One is through the trajectory or the pattern that the bell in the body follows. So as opposed to a hinge pattern movement, we use more of a pendulum-based movement that would resemble more of a scooping pattern. So when you use a scooping pattern, what happens is, is essentially you're recycling the energy back into every single repetition. So the bell will fall as the body falls, and you can see my knees are migrating forward. Then from here, as the bell goes back, my hips and my body goes back. And then there's, in fact, a re-raising of everything else. So what happens is the bell's raised to a higher point. So now you can ride the wave of momentum down, and you can essentially scoop on the way down as if you were doing a vertical jump. Because what will happen is, is, you know, I'll ask you guys, and I always ask this in my workshops, is when you're doing a hard style swing, and I use that time and place hands down, it's amazing, what's the main direction of force, or what's the main direction that the bell's going when you're doing a hard style swing? Forward. Forward, exactly. But in a, in a jerk, or let's say in a snatch, yeah. where does the bell need to finish? Up. Uh, overhead right so what we learn in kettlebell sport is to not only accelerate decelerate controlled how do we work with momentum but how can we use our body against the weight as opposed to having to use muscular effort yeah. so what will happen is as the bell swings through we'll in fact counterbalance our body back as if we're leaning and if the timing's right essentially it almost feels effortless so we almost we scoop the weight up into the rack position and now just by redirecting our body and leaning back against it what was a primarily horizontal horizontal or forward force vector now we combine vertical and horizontal so think about like the second pull in olympic yeah, league. what does that exactly serve right what was going through my head, yeah. and, and that's why in my experience why a lot of uh the olympic coaches that i've worked with like a lot of them don't like kettlebells it's because a lot of the people shoot the bar forward yeah. you know when they're coming from it so Time and place. So, like, I, I work on a swing. I just call it the Olympic swing. And essentially, it combines the power expression of a hinge-based swing or, or, let's say, a hard style type swing. It involves the mechanics of a pendulum-based swing. So, we incorporate the horizontal and force vectors. And then we incorporate a triple extension position at the top to essentially dynamically balance the weight and the body. So, you can use just the body and, and the trajectory to redirect the bell in a vertical position. So, when you scoop back, are you looking to get up on the heels at times, like where you'll see, like I've seen Cotter, you know, I see some guys get into the heel a little bit and they get that little that rot and then pop. Is that something that you practice during this competition, that, that heel kick? You will see some people do that, but at least in my experience, what I found is, I mean, the feet as the, as the, the main platform for, you know, everything comes from the feet up. I like keeping my feet flat to the floor, uh, especially through the big toe so I can push and accelerate through. Especially like even once I really... You know, I, it was interesting. You know, we always hear root through the floor, right? right? Root through the floor when you're lifting. And it wasn't honestly until I took a, a course in barefoot rehabilitation that I really understood what that, mean, what that means and how important are the feet. And actually, once I started getting my feet and my toes to actually start working, no joke, within I think like two workouts, I had an 18 rep PR on my lifts. Wow. Just by getting the feet and being able to transfer that force from the ground into the body on up. 
Oh. So I would say, going back to that, it would be the, the mechanics of the movement, so the pendulum-based swing, right, that redirects mm -hmm. the vel into a vertical position, and we can ride that wave of momentum and contraction. Then uh, I would say, we can talk about breathing after, but the breathing is very different, right? But then definitely the rack position. So the rack position is a compensation strategy of what we use because when I was, you know, what got me into kettlebell sport or actually what, what in, with the injury I sustained in kettlebell sport was uh, a compartment syndrome in my arm that no one could figure out except for uh, you guys know Paul Check super well. Yeah. He loves you guys. Right. So he, we may, maybe touch on him a little bit after. I'd love to share my experience with him because he's been such a great teacher for me and such a great help over the years. But the rack position is essentially a compensation strategy that we use in order to get some position of energetic rest. So in a, in a good solid rack position, kettlebell sport specific to compete at a high level, the legs are completely straight to which we actually turn off the quads and you can shake the quads. So the legs get a, an energetic rest more or less. Then the elbows are tucked in and you're actually resting the elbows on the iliac crest. So from this position, we turn off the shoulders. So we've turned off the quads, we turn off the shoulders. And then from here, when you dip down in the jerk, you maintain that level of connection and then you come up. So actually the arms only come up, honestly, just like an Olympic barbell, it should be you duck underneath yeah. the weight. So you're almost driving the bell off the the, the hip and the lat, in a sense, exactly. versus so the versus like a pressing, sitting high up where so many people are used to with like, say, like a front squat using kettlebells. Yeah, you're definitely not doing the elbows up because the more you can use the legs to drive the power from the earth into the arms into the bell, the more, we call it the bump. Okay. So it almost looks like a wave-like fashion where boom, and then you drive underneath it and jerk. That's sexy. Yeah. What is a 10-minute world champ doing with 72-pound kettlebells? Well, it depends what weight class. Obviously, weight class and oh, stuff like that. Cool. Uh, but at least uh, the organization that I compete in, which is uh, the WAKSC. Uh, so that organization, so I weighed, uh, I was in at that one, which was two years ago in 2017. I think I was in the 160-pound-ish right class. So I was doing... Uh, 232 kilo bells and I was 51 reps um, and then I also compete in the 5 minute category for 240 kilo weights, 240 kilo bells as well I'm going to do 10 sets of 5 on that set it down <laughs> in between hey, um, we're going to take a quick break but to be honest with you I can see that you're like a real student of the barbell and movement and this is freaking awesome, <laughs> awesome. when we get back I want to get into some of the new stuff because when I scroll through your Instagram account the stuff you're talking about, I've never seen some of it awesome, let's learn Shrugged listeners, welcome to the Shrugged Collective Program Vault. Over the last six years, we've been leading the charge in online strength and conditioning programming and coaching. And for the first time in the history of the Shrugged Collective, we're combining our 11 best-selling long-term and short-term accessory programs into one membership site called the Program Vault. From Olympic weightlifting to strongman, leaning out, nutrition, you name it, our 11 best-selling programs are yours for $47 a month. Get to shruggedcollective.com backslash vault and you will find immediate access to our 11 best-selling strength conditioning programs. Welcome back to Marvel Shrugged. I'm Anders Warner, ABR, Doug Larson, Mike Salemi. Yo, this uh, this new piece of movement that you're getting into, some sandbags, some throwing this thing around your body with long straps, which I'd never seen before. <laughs> but you mentioned Paul Check before the break, yeah. and uh, we got to interview him. I'm still not really sure how much he came into my soul in that interview, <laughs> but I feel him. And his name comes up a lot, and I don't know if I'm projecting him through me, <laughs> but uh, what was your relationship with him? How did you guys find each other? And Yo, what is the shaman up to when he's when he's fixing your arm? No one else can do it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've been studying Paul's work since pretty much right near when I was at the highest level of powerlifting for me. So right before I went to Westside. So when I was 18 years old, I was working at a, as an SNC coach at a holistic lifestyle center. So I was so blessed and I, I feel incredibly grateful because that center essentially was modeled all after his teachings. So at a fairly young age, I was exposed to Paul Check's work, how to eat, move, and be healthy. And then later, I wanted just to take my coaching to a whole nother level. And so I started enrolling in some of his classes. And I, you know, at that point when I was studying his work, I mean, Paul's really made his name off of, he's really solved medical failures, whether it's been professional sports teams, cancer, you name it. The, the cases that no one would want to take or could take, when someone's been through 10 or 20 doctors, they would go see him, right? So I remember being in his holistic lifestyle level coach two class, 
And at the end, we do uh, essentially a commitment for a meditation practice to do 100 days straight of consecutive medication, uh, meditation. And he would sign this, this wooden stick that we use in a gong practice, we call it. And I remember being in a long line of people from all over the world. And, like, I didn't have – essentially, I had just come off of a kettlebell sport comp. And at that time, I was trying to reach one of the highest levels in the sport. And almost four years consistently, if I recall correctly – Every single competition, I would get close but fail, get close but fall short, get close but fall short, and it was such a self-destructive process that it was just, it was to the, it just destroyed me. And I remember being in tears, and I was just like, "Who do I go to? What do I do?" And I had HLC two at that time lined up a few weeks after one this this one competition, and I was like, Fuck, "You know, I'm just gonna ask. I'm gonna ask. Does he take clients or what?" Because at that time, he, you know, to me, especially as a student and studying for years, I was like. Oh, Paul checks up here. You know, he'll never, you know, doesn't work with the common man. And uh, I remember being in class and I was just like in the line. I just within five minutes with a whole line of people behind me, I was like, you know, Paul, I have this issue with my arm. No one can figure it out. I've been trying for two and a half years. I've seen nine different practitioners, all good people, great people, but I just can't figure out what's going on. And he asked me like two questions at the time, felt around and he goes, I think I know what it is, but I can't, I goes, I can't be for sure. I can't promise you anything. I need to get you down to San Diego, get you on a table and assess you. It's going to take one to two days at least to assess <laughs> you and write a program. Yeah. Uh, this much an hour and, uh, you know, write our assistant, Vidya, at that time and uh, let me know. And so I wrote, om- I think it was, because they were moving the institute at that point uh, to where they are now in Carlsbad. And uh, it took them almost three months to respond back. And I was, I think I did another competition before that, failed again, and I was just like, you know, what What can I do? And within a few days after, I got a response email saying, hey, we received your request. We'd love to have you come down. Come on down to San Diego. So I booked a trip to, to work with Paul. And, you know, after a whole day of assessments and all, all sorts of stuff, essentially, I mean, it was a number of different things. But the main thing that was being expressed was a compartment syndrome in my arm. So essentially, at every challenging attempt, whether it was duration, whether it was load, you name it, my forearm would fill up with blood. I'd kind of lose feeling in my hand. I'd be forced to drop the bells. But I didn't know exactly what the root cause was. And so with him, because he views the body as a system of systems, he looked at obviously diet, lifestyle. He has a whole totem pole approach I'm sure he shared with you guys. So what we found that I had a few of the things was an atlas axis subluxation uh, that was causing a bunch of shifts down chain. I had an anatomical short leg, which was causing me essentially to almost like I was lifting in a hole. So usually, if I recall correctly, about five millimeters or so. If you're within five millimeters, it's not so significant. If it's above five millimeters, if I recall correctly, that's when it's significant. And I had between an eight or nine millimeter, conferred by x-ray, disparity between the left and the right foot. So anatomical short leg, uh, atlas acus subluxation, and also to your question earlier, I had a huge imbalance between the mover system and the stabilizer system, so the tonic and the phasic system. So what would happen is, is I think from powerlifting and having like a really strong motor, like I was very strong for the weights that I was lifting, and even now, like I will always say that I'm way more a strength athlete than I am an endurance athlete, which is why I like the challenge of kettlebell sport. Still, anything more than three reps is high rep for me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. but um, too much Louis Simmons in you there. Too too much Louis Simmons. Yeah. In you. <laughs> so. Uh, going back to you know your question, what 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 it, what I noticed was is and what Paul really identified was there was such relatively speed. I mean, a ten minute set is really tough. So to be able to maintain alignment and maintain structural integrity overhead and not essentially hang off your ligaments and compensate through excessive anterior tilt or drifting the arms back is almost impossible. And what I found is that was happening so much earlier. And essentially, as the bells would come up, I would do whatever I could do to get them in the in into into the rack position but I didn't have the stabilization to maintain good technique as the later reps went on. So when you look at the best lifters in the world, so my main kettlebell sport coach right now is Dennis Vasiliev. So he's eight-time world champion. The dude weighs, I think he's 185, give or take, 101 reps with double 32s in 10 minutes. Yeah, like insane, insane. But the amazing thing is is when you look (laughs) at him on rep 101 compared to rep number one, they almost look identical. Obviously, he's sweating. Obviously, he's working. Facial expressions will show, but it's so amazing to see a technician like that. And so whether it's an Olympic weightlifting, whether it's 40, you know, whatever, whether it's just the bar, 200 kilos, it should look close to the same, right? And so Paul identified that, and he's like, wow, we really got to do some some serious corrective work to bring up your, your, your ability to maintain postural endurance. And so that was a big thing from a conditioning standpoint. So 
um, you know, fast forward two and a half years. So what, what I would do is pretty much every single month I would fly down to San Diego, spend one to two days with Paul. We would do a check-in in the morning. Uh, all during that time, pretty much we would uh, track all of my markers of musculoskeletal system stress, limbic emotional stress, and hormonal stress on a daily basis. It was on essentially a Google Docs that I created. He would be able to check it on real time and really, in, a, in, in addition to his uh, four doctor system, really start correlating all the lifestyle factors, whether it was I was under relationship stress or I was under family stress, and exactly how that was affecting my training and everything else in my performance. So two and a half years of once a month traveling down and really assessing, checking in, writing a program. Um, it was just an amazing experience. Absolutely amazing. And you had mentioned, uh, you know, what does the shaman do? And I remember the first time I went to his, his office, which is in a beautiful place. Gorgeous. You guys have been there. Yeah. yeah. It is fun. And you look on the table and there's so <laughs> many herbs. It's a legit view. It's like, it's like at, at the peak of, of a mountain, more or less, where there's big cliffs on each side of his house. It's like you know, 270 out of the 360 degrees around his house is, is a fucking big drop off over a canyon. It looks <laughs> yeah. fucking amazing. Like if you yeah. were to find a way to become Paul Check, you have to go to a top of a mountain <laughs> <laughs> to be able to understand the insights that he would have into movement and health. I, and I imagine he just lived in a cave in a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> one or the other. Yeah, yeah, maybe he not have like a wait, normal Wait, he's house. got a house? Yeah. Like <laughs> no, that's his office. Got it's it. like a multi-million dollar office with like a library. The Yeah, the, the books that are in there from like 1900s, like strength and conditioning, which they had it all figured out back then anyways, and now it's just regurgitated um stones outside totally so a water charger did you stack rocks yeah that oh, was that was a good deal of uh, you know it's cool. to stack rocks yeah, it's, it's like chess for strong people we right say. <laughs> i have i actually got to meet paul check here for the first time oh cool but very early on uh during my mma career uh like 22 i saw this ad uh, not an ad but a, um, an article on him in uh, muscle and fitness and i'm like i like turn it open in the in the uh, grocery store and the first thing that catches my eye is this kind of older dude <laughs> standing on a BOSU ball, on a, on, a, on a stability ball with two 32-pound kettlebells in his hand, like doing a shoulder press. And I'm like, who's that guy? Yeah. I need to buy this magazine and figure this out. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and now, I mean, it's incredible seeing uh, all the information he's put together in all these books and the holistic programs. It, how, how long ago was that that then you got the HL Holistic Lifestyle Coaching and you went through this you know, treatment with him? We started working together, if I recall, somewhere in like 2013, maybe. Oh, so not, uh, I mean, not too far. No, very recent. I would say, yeah. And then we did two and a half years of very, I mean, we, he still might, you know, I still consult with him for sure if I can't figure something out. But really, it was two and a half years of once a month going down every single month, uh, going through the whole rehabilitative process and then building me back up as a, as a you know, decently high level competitor. Wow, that's an awesome resource. Yeah. yeah. So you're still competing in kettlebell sport. I am. Uh, right now I'm going to take a little bit of a break because I want to focus on some of the other things that I'm really into and starting to build my brand and really get out there a little bit more because, you know, it takes, I mean, to compete at a high level, it's, it's your life. And yeah. training, training is still my life, but I really want to, one of the messages for me right now that I've been getting is for me to really grow to the next level, it has to be about everyone else. Yeah. And so developing more programs, doing what I can do to travel, teach, and really just share what I love, whether it's a combination of Paul stuff, kettlebells, Bulgarian bags, Eldoas, you name it. Like, Hold on, slow down. we got to get into all that. <laughs> <laughs> just awesome. gonna ah, just call pretty much all this stuff. Um, that shocked everybody. Yeah, it's a Bulgarian bag. <laughs> yeah, Bulgarian bags. Let's just break them down. Talk yeah. about them. What do we got? Bulgarian bags, go. So Bulgarian bags developed by Coach Ivan Ivanov. So a Bulgarian Olympian. Uh, I believe he was actually at the year uh, that Krasmir was at the Olympics in 96. So Bulgarian Olympian, but also one of the former U.S. Olympic coaches. And a Bulgarian bag, if anyone listening to the show is, is looking one up online, it almost looks like a sandbag that's kind of like in a horseshoe shape. Yep. And essentially what he was looking for was a tool that he created. Now, the Bulgarian bag is only one out of five tools in his whole conditioning system. He was looking for a tool that would mimic all, specifically wrestling, but it, would have, it has applications hands down to all grappling sports, uh, which I'll kind of get into in a little bit. But every single movement that he used and created with the Bulgarian bag all mimic sports-specific movements, whether it's throws. You, you name it, and the most iconic movement is what we call the supless spin. So his company is supless, and it's the supless Bulgarian How bag. How's that spelled? S-U-P-L-E-S. Boom. There it is. Oh. <laughs> right on the shirt. There we go. Yeah. So, but an incredibly fun tool. And if I were to say, so 
you may have seen me. I don't know if you could see me, but the ball that I was swinging around yesterday. Yeah. So we that's see everything. You see everything <laughs> up from up here. We're, 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 on, cloud, we're on clouds. Uh, the supless ball uses very similar movements to the Bulgarian bag. So the spin type movement where essentially the, the Bulgarian bag is primarily designed for strength and power, especially grip and cardiovascular conditioning. But if I were to say the most, it would be grip, strength, and power. And when you compare that to the supless ball, you're really, really working speed and endurance. And you're learning how to accelerate force, how you're learning how to decelerate force through rotation. All the movements, all mimic fight movements, especially in the sport of wrestling. So it's an incredibly fun tool. And every single person that I put have gotten their hands on the bag has fell in love. Like, especially for the jiu-jitsu athletes, we make jiu-jitsu sleeves out of gi material. And so, I mean, the main training bag that I use personally is a 37-pound bag. When I was first using the gi sleeve, coming from a 37-pound bag, I was literally using a 17-pound bag. And the increments between bags, you could kind of think of it like kettlebells, like a four-kilo yeah. increment on a bell. Yeah, that's a lot of weight. Lot. That's actually something I wanted to talk about a little bit with the kettlebell stuff. It's like yeah. when you look at kettlebells, it's like I've got 16, 32, 53, <laughs> 72, 100, <laughs> like 88. <laughs> How, like – there are ones in between, yeah. and some people just don't buy them. Yeah, but, like, you know, like, there isn't, like, these small progressions that you can take in these sports. So from a 17-pound bag to a 34-pound bag, how long is that progression in that people can learn these things? So it's a great question. Well, now when you've got companies like Kettlebell Kings, for example, so it used to be, with bells at least, four kilo increments. But now they manufacture two kilo increments in all they, – they sell both cast iron type bells but also competition bells, and the competition for sure in two kilo increments. So it makes the developmental progression so much easier. And even like usually – you can even kind of a jimmy rig like a one kilo increment too. Or like sometimes you'll see maybe my Instagram like I've got plate mates that I've taped on and, mm -hmm. you know uh, – you I've just seen the fraction plate like duct taped on the just, bottom of the yeah. bell. Doesn't anyone have it like a big magnet, like a one-pound magnet or something? They do. There are companies, yeah, that will for sure do that. Just make mm -hmm. sure that the magnet is strong enough so it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> fling off. Fly off. Yeah. Someone goes blind for the kettlebell swing. <laughs> so we're super fortunate now to have smaller increments, so yeah. it makes the training process much, much easier. But in the bags, I mean, once someone – because the bags really – there's four main dynamic movements that you use with the bag that we teach in certifications. Number one is the spin, which is more of a rotational-based movement. Number two is the snatch. So all the way through the legs, kind of like a kettlebell swing, up, punch overhead, repeating that. The third is an arm throw. And then the fourth is we call a swing squat, where essentially pull the bag through the legs, squat, almost like a, a swing squat with a kettlebell, but different implement. Mm -hmm. So those are the four main movements, but there's just like kettlebells, there's hundreds of movements that you can use, and they're all different patterns. How do we change angles from one position to the next? How do we train levels from high to low? Yeah. How do we rotate? How do we do all these things seamlessly and rhythmically from one movement to the next? I think it's really easy to get lost in the kettlebell world, too, because everyone just thinks swing, yeah. snatch, clean. And the flowing stuff that you're doing and piecing all this stuff together in, like, continuous movement. And you talked about how you're running a seminar here on the, the flowing warm-up. Uh, is that just bringing all these pieces of your training life together? And kind of where does that come from and how do you structure those? Th I guess the purpose of flow is not to be structured. But, <laughs> um, yeah, like, especially in teaching it to people. Yeah, I think, you know, I was really fortunate. You know, my, my background at first started off, quote, unquote, hard style. So developing, you know, movements that stem from the deadlift or powerlifting-based movement, grinding-based movement, strength-based movements. And then I love that, but then when I wanted that challenge for kettlebell sport, then I learned, okay, I can take this base, this, this, this power, strength, structural integrity type system, but now I got to learn how to breathe. I got to learn how to be more rhythmic. I got to learn how to conserve my energy and essentially be a little bit more athletic, right? It's more Olympic-based movements that you have to do for 10 minutes. So being very, very, like, fully, fully immersed as a hard style practitioner, kettlebell sport practitioner, and then just wanting, honestly, in recent years, and it was so funny, you know, in Paul's program, I'll always, I'll always remember, he focuses a lot on play. You know, I'm a very serious athlete. You know, I do every, as, to the best of my ability, everything I can to reach the next level. And he was like, you need to play. Like, I'm literally, like, I never had a coach legitimately right in your program on a day, play. Water in the water, water play, 20 minutes. What, so, essentially, I had to schedule time to get out there and play. And where I'm at right now. Did you find it hard to play? In the I mean, it was, yeah, like, yeah. wait, how do I play? How do I not compete? Right. How do, how do I dis How do I not turn this into a workout? Yes. Right. So unbound play was very something something very hard for me in the beginning, but 
over time, you kind of just you just kind of fall into a groove and you get with it and you start enjoying it a little bit more. So I so think is that, that like a time of like planned experimentation time where you can just you're playing, but really you're trying out new things, you're innovating, you're seeing what new things might feel good that you can incorporate into your workout later. Is that the is that the point? The play for me in that situation, the play was actually something that was incorporated in all all cycles, so it wasn't like a testing. But we definitely did on the off season. Let's say, okay, we're going to try and gain a little bit more mass here. We're going to do you know play with some different strategies, but the play was more one just to just to balance my life stressors mm. and just to have a more well-rounded approach to lifting it in life because you know what had happened was is for for most of my life i was the all-or-nothing athlete and so if i lost it was mentally and, and emotionally destructive but i didn't really have this concept of what is a process goal how do we enjoy the journey how do we get more enjoyment so that whatever happens or even if my life doesn't you know if i stop being a competitive athlete that i can still be happy and, and love myself at the end of the day essentially and so that play, I think, was such a huge part. One, two, from a physical perspective, like doing unbound play in the water to decompress and just move after some double days is amazing for the body. But then what I found, it's like there's no rules. Like no one's judging me. And yeah. what I've gotten, you know, and even right now, why I really kind of want to break from the sport just for a little bit is honestly, and that's why I love the Bulgarian bag and some of these tools, man, like and flows with bells. Like I just want to play. Like, I don't want to have the pressure to go out. Like, yeah. I just want to move, feel good, and just play. It kind of reminds me of a – there was a, uh, you know, like a, a study done on children. And when they were in kindergarten, they were like, who here can sing? Everybody puts their hands up. Who here can dance? Everybody puts their hands up. And then they asked, you know, third graders. And it was down, like, 60%. Because mm. now they're being judged and graded on their ability to do those things. Singing class, art class. Right. So it's like for someone like you, you built everything up to be, you know, for a function of strong and this and that. And you lost the ability to just move without this context. Yes. So doing this, did you even feel like that helped your injuries? I mean, was that something that kind of assisted in you staying injury free was the play? Was that one of the was that one of the aspects or one of the, the thoughts behind play? I would say so. I would say so. And one thing I mean, when you're competing at a high level, I mean, injuries are going to happen like. They're just It just comes with the territory, but at least you have more tools in your toolbox to like, okay, if things do get out of hand, like, what do I do? And so that's what I really learned is, okay, getting in the ocean and playing, ice cold water after training, going to the beach. Half Moon Bay, if you guys have ever been, is like ice cold water. <laughs> yeah. And Where's really dangerous. Half Moon, yeah. Bay. Half Moon Bay, beautiful yeah. place. Uh, okay, I, was, I was at Mavericks last year when it was 25 foot. Yeah, so pretty. Frightening. So oh, that's a real thing? <laughs> oh, it's terrifying. <laughs> Literally, you'll step like three feet out in the water. You're like, okay, that, there's a drop off right there. Like, I'm, I'm cool right here. Uh, it, it was, like, you can't really like see the wave, but it, it's coming in and you can see this just like monster and it's so far out it's so menacing and there's rocks in front of it i don't mean it's you know, it's fucking terrifying <laughs> sorry <laughs> i just derailed this conversation sorry <laughs> no <laughs> half moon bay go ahead it's cold water it's cold You're water <laughs> sorry <laughs> different healing therapies play <laughs> movement but yeah and, and that's where the flows came yeah. in where really my so in the first day of the workshop that i taught here was an introduction to kettlebell sport but more than that it was more just teaching people the principles of movement and energetic efficiency that they can take through any movement practice and then yesterday was essentially it was warming up with kettlebell, so just a different perspective. And then we did primarily all Bulgarian bags, and then I did a little ball demo at the end just to give people that experience. And what does this ball look like? So the you were, you, were, you explain yeah. the you explain the uh, the other thing quite well. What does this ball? What does the ball look like? So the ball the bag looks like a let's just say Dude, a black medicine it ball. After. It's awesome. Yeah, black medicine ball really cool. with, with with straps on both sides. And okay. so essentially, so where the Bulgarian bag is very grip intensive. Um, the ball, you don't really have to deal with that because we essentially have just these wooden rungs that you hold on to. Okay. And literally the testing protocol that we run at certifications is like, you know, almost like a 10-minute more or less like unbroken protocol. So you have to be able to go one movement to the next and not set it down where if you use a different, like a legit size a Bulgarian bag and you were doing dynamic movements, there's no way you'd be able to last. So much more speed focus. If you check out my Instagram, you'll, you'll just see some of the transitions and some of the neat combinations and coordination movements. There's so much that we do. We do slams with them. We do lateral walking, forward walking, back. So any plane, any movement, um, you can really, you know, have fun with it. Does it have like a ball, like like a like a more of a, a buoyant structure, or is it more like a slam ball, like a like a deads on the ground? No, no, it'll actually it'll slam and then it'll it'll bounce back. Oh, okay, so you, cool. You learn to catch it in different positions and drop down and move. Oh, so that sounds cool. I, a lot of times when we think about like core training, 
Everyone really tries to, I, I don't even want to say the sit-up thing because I think we've all kind of gotten past that, but <laughs> nobody really understands. Work your core, bro. Yeah, work <laughs> core. Um, but when I see you do these things, it's incredible how much, like, core stability has to go into creating power and maintaining neutral spine. And how has that kind of affected the kettlebell side of thing or your performance goals or just in general, I feel like nobody knows about these training methods, but when I see you do them, I'm like, uh, we all need to do that. <laughs> why, why is that under a rock and no one knows about it? It's, it's, it's awesome that you're talking about it um, and bringing it to the public because I feel like it's very, very important that people understand what you're doing. Yeah, especially with, you know, classically, most kettlebell movements are primarily sagittal. There's now there's more people doing circular movements and stuff like that, and we could say the snatch, a single arm snatch, there is some element of rotation, but not too much. But with the bag, I mean, it's I always say it's like it makes rotation training fun again, because like there's so much rotational effort, and you have to learn like you can't be rigid and stiff the whole time. Like yeah. a, you know, like when you're learning uh, even just uh, a kettlebell swing, like first you start with the deadlift and you progress up, or Romanians or whatever, and you could start slow. With the bag, definitely you have to be technical and you have to hit all your positions. But if you try and muscle it, it'll bang. Like you have to learn how to be fluid and time that breath stabilization sequence. So when you accelerate, that's the moment that you breath hold and then you expel air through yeah. first lips. Very Actually, much. Stu McGill, and you could probably speak on this a little bit. Uh, I went to one of his seminars and he was talking about how like when people kick or they punch, the breathing and then having that like whip in the middle and th I see a lot of that in, in what you're what you're doing and what you're talking about with that rotational stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when it, what's what's interesting too with that? I mean, what you're saying that everything's so sagittal and frontal is so much so much of our movement and so much power is in the transverse. Mm. I mean, like Ken Griffey Jr.'s swing. I mean, it was effortless, and that thing that was all hips. Yeah, Ken Griffey I mean, like Jr. his hip. Was Huge like <laughs> call right there. We dude. all just had Boom. Yeah! <laughs> Wait, do I get one of those? Ken yeah. Jr. made it to the podcast. <laughs> and God, that's awesome. <laughs> Buzzword. And, uh, I mean, I think that that, trans, <laughs> that transverse movement is lacking, and it's cool to see, uh, like, some, somebody like Onnit or, or Suplice being able to kind of show these transverse movements as so many people actually create injuries when they go to the side of any sort, you know, mm. just picking up something or any of that. Have you, with like, do you apply this to general people? And like, what are the results that they see as like you're someone who's on this upper crust, right? Like where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a very high performer versus someone that's walking into the gym. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, nine to fiver and I come here three days a week. What am I going to expect from transverse movement and a little bit more flow in my life with strength? Well, I think at least in my experience, I mean, even before when someone first comes in the door, whether they're an elite athlete, general pop, you name it, like the first thing that I'm looking at is do they have the prerequisites to meet whatever, whatever the exercise is, right? Done safely or at least done with good movement mechanics, there's no bad exercise, right? And if they can meet the prerequisite, they can, even on a kettlebell movement, like if they can get their arms overhead without compensation, then obviously they meet the prerequisites for overhead. Like we're looking at the shoulder, the spine, et cetera. So if someone can meet the prerequisites and they've been cleared, then I know at least they're safe to move forward in that. And then within that person, depending where they are level-wise, conditioning-wise, movement-wise, and coordination-wise, because the Bulgarian bag in incorporates a tremendous amount of coordination effort, we essentially, like for the supla spin, I think in our testing protocol or our education system, we have almost like 12 progressive movements leading up to it. So before even someone spins, they literally, like I'll just spend even just an open arm swing, I'll just spend as much time as I need there. And then once they've mastered that, then you move them. So they may take longer, and especially depending on the athlete. Like when I've worked with, let's say, runners compared to a gymnast. So their movement vocabulary is going to be much less than, let's say, a gymnast or runner compared because they're, they've just been conditioned in this one movement. So they may take longer, whether it's progression-wise or even their program may be much longer. So I've got one swimmer that I was working with for a number of years, and she, very good athlete. How are they for coordination, side to side? They were actually okay, but, okay. In, but in terms so – actually, she was, she was actually not bad. Um, but one of the things that I remember was the programs that I would put her on would be two to three times longer than someone, let's say, who had a wrestling background or gymnastics background or jujitsu, you name it. So even myself, like I remember I was changing programs even when I was at uh, working around that time of when I was at Westside almost at once a week 
once a week, once it was two, two week, two week cycles because I needed that changing of stimulus. And that's even when pro Paul would program for me, it would always change. Right. But with, with her, uh, you know, she needed to, even just the first two weeks, she was just learning how to, the nervous system was just learning how to coordinate these movements. So possibly staying on a program longer or just spending more time working through the progressions provided they make the, meet the prerequisites for every stage in that process. Fish out of water. Fish out of water, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what does all of this look like in five years from you? Like, I feel like you're already so far ahead in this kind of like understanding movement culture and implementing you know, different implements and, or objects. Like, what? where do you go with this? Yeah, I'm honestly, I still feel like I've got so much to learn and there's still so many coaches yeah. that I want to work with and learn. Like in June, I'll be spending a few weeks in Boise with Ivan, training with his wrestlers and just learning more. So even just in his system, the bag is one tool, the ball is another tool. He's got something called the gladiator wall, the Hertz fighter, and dummies, throw dummies. And every single one of those, there's education systems built around yeah. it. So just like we have a level one and level two Bulgarian bag, although the, I think it's only the ball we have level one, the other ones he will develop educational systems. So there's so much that I don't know, and I'm so, even what I, ha what I do know, I want to just keep learning and as much as I can get that out there. So I want the Salemi system. Tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm working. So right now I'm definitely developing a bunch of content and online especially because I want to see how many people I can reach. And uh, so I'm working on a bunch of stuff, and hopefully in the next few months I've got one project I'm really excited about, uh, kettlebell related primarily. Uh, so, you know, definitely if, if listeners want to, you know, if the best place to find me is social media on Instagram. What's this program all about? Uh, I want to say I, I can't really can't really divulge. Tease just, us, tease us. So it's a pro. I will say it's a program for anyone who truly is interested for coaches. It's not for everyone. One thing I've realized the hard way teaching workshops is, uh, you know, I'm a people pleaser by by nature, and one of the things I, I was teaching a workshop, and it was almost 30 people, and uh, I was teaching this workshop, and the result it was almost three hours. And most all the people there, like 90% of the people absolutely loved it. Like the feedback was, he's passionate, uh, he's form focused, he's technique focused. Wow, I love the instruction. And then maybe 5%, it was interesting because it was a donation-based workshop that I did for a new gym opening up. There was, I think like a handful of five or six people that showed up drunk. And I was like, or showed up from partying the night before. Yeah. And some of the comments were, he's boring, he's bossy. And one of the things I realized was the same content, the same delivery of information that I go into whatever seminars give my whole heart all this is my this has been my life since I can remember. The same information presented to the wrong people could do actually harm to your business. And so what I realized is, I mean, I'll work with anyone, but I gravitate most towards athletes and especially coaches. So what I realized is even though like this program will definitely be for anyone who wants to learn bells at a foundational level, it will be primarily geared towards coaches, geared towards, you know, uh, a non-dogmatic approach, let's say, to learning kettlebells. And um, it'll be accessible for, for all people. So how to coach, how to spot things, and, um, and, and essentially just go through a basic developmental process of what, hopefully what it takes to be, in my eyes, a good coach through a learn-by-doing program. So there'll be breaks, practicing, and stuff like that. Because, you know, at any skill, you know, to be a master of any skill or come close to mastering any skill, you have to practice it. Right. So what I found as a coach is especially, you know, right now I'm either traveling, teaching or working on some educational content for online. And what I found over the years and I've had this conversation with Paul is, you know, he shared with me once he goes, you know, Mike, you've taken all these classes with me. And we were talking about, you know, we'll do some online stuff in the in the future together. He was like, you've taken all these classes. And, you know, after you sit, you sat in my classes for five days, what was the experience like? And I was like, shit, man, exercise coach, which is the base level of his practitioner side, amazing. Changed the game for me in terms of learning how to be a more well-rounded personal trainer and learn it at, like, the body as a system of systems. And he goes, after five days, how much mastery did you have of the information? I was like, dude, I probably retained 2%. And so what he shared and showed me is like, well, one thing, if you really want to master any craft, you have to practice it. And so even though the online medium is not perfect, what it can allow for someone to review, rewind, and, and stick with it. And if there's some live component, even better. But the main thing is that we practice these skills. Otherwise, there's no, especially kettlebells, you know, or, or any of these Olympic movements, Bulgarian bags. You have to get your hands on the equipment, put on the reps, and just put in the work. And just know that it ain't going to happen overnight. You know, that, and, and that's why, you know, even working with Paul, why I chose, like, I want to work with him until, and I could still learn so much from him. 
but you know I felt very good and he gave me his blessing after two and a half years he goes dude you're, you're ready to you write your own program or you work with other coaches and uh, you're ready um, so that's that's what it was like very that's cool. a huge blessing <laughs> yeah. where can people find you so best place to find me is on Instagram mike.salemi uh, I've got a website www.mikesalemi.io that I'm currently building up but Instagram is the best place to find me and uh, if there's any questions educational material anything I'm always down always willing to to share as much as I can with people very cool That's before awesome. he starts talking get some strong coffee in your life the stuff is delicious now you fill in all the things that I don't know about <laughs> <laughs> well it's delicious it's it is instant. delicious you guys have uh, coached me well on that and you know I uh, it's uh, it's an incredible product. It's an incredible opportunity yeah. to bring something to the market that's uh, going to change people's lives in the sense of spending less time making coffee and standing in line and more time doing the shit that matters. So it's uh, instant formula with collagen, hyaluronic acid, coconut water extract, L-theanine, and uh, MCT oil all put in an instant formula that mixes in hot or cold. Use BBS 20 for 20% off. We're 14 mm. interviews At in four days. Strong coffee works. Strong coffee. Gonna make it better. <laughs> Go to strongcoffeecompany.com. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Doug Larson. And it mixes incredibly well. It does. It does. Well. It does. Yeah. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Douglas E. Larson. Come and find me at Anders Varner. Even more important, get into the Shrug Collective at Shrug Collective on all the things. Like, subscribe. Find us on iTunes. Leave a nice comment. Tell Mike Salemi he's a gangster. <laughs> I would like to thank you a lot. Thanks, uh, yes. This yeah. I thank really, you. really, really enjoy being around people that are really experts in all kinds of fields, like living somewhere in between practitioner, strength coach, and experimenting in everything they do because you're able to take all the principles and combine them into something that is truly Mike Salimi. And I really appreciate you uh, being here. It's very cool. Thank you, guys. I appreciate we'll you guys, you guys, next guys Wednesday. so much. Thank you. Shrugged listeners, welcome to the Shrugged Collective Program Vault. Over the last six years, we've been leading the charge in online strength and conditioning programming and coaching. And for the first time in the history of the Shrug Collective, we're combining our 11 best-selling long-term and short-term accessory programs into one membership site called the Program Vault. From Olympic weightlifting to strongman, leaning out, nutrition, you name it, our 11 best-selling programs are yours for $47 a month. Get to shruggedcollective.com backslash vault and you will find immediate access to our 11 best-selling strength conditioning programs.